um, I uh, usually give presentations standing up and I've learned that my voice is, uh, uh, lacks a certain amount of excitement when I'm sitting down. So I apologize, this is gonna be a, a low key, low DevOps talk. Anyway, let's begin. Um, uh, thank you all for coming again. Uh, my name is Tom Lumicelli, and uh, I'm uh, the title of my talk is Low Context DevOps, A New Way of Improving SRE Culture. Um, uh, a little about myself. Um, I am, uh, I manage the SRE teams at Stack Overflow. Uh, I've been a sysadmin for much too long. Um, I blog and I tweet, and I've written a number of books on system administration topics. Um, and uh, I mentioned I work at Stack Overflow. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of Stack Overflow. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, some some people. Good, good. That's good. Um, and uh, uh, my current project at Stack Overflow, I'm working on Stack Overflow for Teams, which gives it's a it's a private Q and A experience for like businesses and you know, enter enterprises, organizations that want um, their own question and answer, you know, internal system. And uh, maybe we'll talk about that more later. But um, this talk has uh, three parts. Uh, we're gonna talk about high and low context cultures. Uh, we can talk about this new thing that I coined uh, low context DevOps. And we're gonna end by talking a little about uh, leadership. So low and, or high and low context cultures. Um, so I'm in this talk, I'm going to tell a bunch of stories. Um, this first story, uh, is really the only fictional one. Um, but, uh, this is a story about a, a man traveling in a foreign, foreign land. And he, uh, is in this village and, um, no one will talk to him. The shopkeepers won't talk to him. Other, various people won't talk to him. And, and he's confused until someone explains to him that, you know, in this village, when you enter, you first must approach the elders and get their blessing. And no one's going to talk to you until you've done that. Well, he does that and everything's fine after that. But gosh, you know, later that night, he's thinking, how the hell was I supposed to know that? Right. But, you know, the people that were dealing with him that day were probably or the person that explained this whole thing to him was probably thinking, how the hell could he have not known that, right? Because th this is an example of a high context environment. Like everyone knows something, it's not written down, it's just like everyone knows it. Um, there's a high amount of context that you need to understand to be able to function properly. I'll give you another example. Uh, my first week at Stack Overflow, I was getting trained and uh, my mentor, showed me this process and it was kind of a long, well, it wasn't that long of a process, but it was, it was a, it was a process. And um, uh, none of it was written down. Um, you know, he's explaining to it all to me ex extemporaneously. And uh, I get to the end and I'm like, I can't believe this isn't written down. How, how could I, how would I be expected to, to know this? And he looked at me and he said, well, I just assumed anyone that could get through our difficult interview process would would know these kind of things. And I was like, you know, later that night, I'm, I'm, I'm like the guy in the village. I'm thinking, how could I possibly have known these things? I mean, one of the things on the steps was uh, you, you had to change a default from a one kind of uh, Ethernet NIC to a, a, a non-standard one. And, um, you know, how, how could I have known that they've standardized on this this other device driver, right? So, okay, so these are examples of high context cultures. Uh, a high context culture is where communication is implicit. It's not so written down. It's more like the collective history. Like everyone here knows this because everyone's been around for long enough to know it, right? Um, it's like an inside joke. You know, you had to be there. Um, uh, people have to read between the lines to understand what's going on. Um, often in high co context cultures, everyone's had a very long-term relationship, um, giving them enough time to develop this context. And, um, and often decisions and activities are focused around like face-to-face -face relationships rather than a, a central authority. Um, reading between the lines uh, is, uh, 
is, is a weird skill. I recently um, was involved with, uh, uh, well, I was the new person in a, in a small community and I set up an event and someone replied saying they couldn't make it that night. And I thought, oh, that's, that's a shame. I didn't read between the lines. What that person was saying is you need to reschedule this they're the, the matriarch of this organization. The event can't happen without them. And it was such a faux pas of me to, to not know this, but you know, how could I know? I didn't have the, the high context required to uh, read between the lines and operate successfully in that kind of environment. Contrast that to a low context culture. Low context cultures are where communication is explicit. There are rules and you were told what those rules are so that you can follow them. Uh, this kind of knowledge is codified. It's written down. It's on the, the signs on the wall. Um, uh, a good example is like a, an airport. You're not going to be there very long, so you don't have years to develop this knowledge like you do at um, like maybe a university. So uh, um, where where things are is written on the wall. At uh, you know uh, the signage is very important in a in a airport. Um, and because it's codified and written down, the knowledge is, is more transferable. New people can get up to speed faster. And anthropologists that study this kind of thing um, have actually identified that certain languages have a high or low amount of context built in. Um, a lot of Asian languages, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And um, versus you know, low context languages like you know, German or Dutch where it's very explicit. There's not as much reading between the lines. One of my favorite uh, high tech, uh, high context environments is New York Penn Station. Uh, if you take the train from Boston to New York, you're going to end up at Penn Station. And uh, heaven forbid you try to read the map because the, the map is even high context. I don't think anyone understands this map unless you already understand the layout of Penn Station, which is a shame because the audience for a map is the people that don't already know the layout of Penn Station. Um, uh, and, and actually, this there's this obscure hallway. Oh, so I, I, well, in the before times, I commuted through Penn Station every day, twice a day, because I live in New Jersey and I work in, in New York City at Stax headquarters. And uh, I pass through Penn Station. And um, I take the shortcut through this little obscure hallway. And I love the sign here because it's so high context. It says the Seventh Avenue subway is to the left. Now you need a lot of context to understand what the signs mean. What the signs means because 30 years ago they changed the name of the Seventh Avenue subway to the One Two Three line. So to truly understand this sign, you have to have the the context that someone would have if they've been around for 30 years. That's that's totally unreasonable. And um, I took this picture on the day that I realized that that sign's illuminated. There's a little light bulb behind that sign that lights it up. Now, light bulbs don't last 30 years, don't last 30 years. So someone has been changing this light bulb for 30 years, and that person does not have the agency to tell their boss, hey, we need to fix this sign. And, and that gave me a lot of... Uh, Give me a lot of thought. Uh, that I, I paused to to think about that a lot. That's that's when I took this fine. Anyway, I, that's when I took the picture. Okay, so that's um, the anthropology concept of low and high context cultures, um, which leads me to low context DevOps. Um, I make the assertion that a DevOps or SRE environment should be low context, and I I hope you agree. I feel that we should. Um, the information you need should be available, and the way we design things should require as little context as possible. We should spend more time working, less time frustrated with roadblocks and information gaps. Um, but most of all, we shouldn't just change the light bulb. We should fix the darn sign. So I'm going to talk about um, three different areas that are very high context and uh, that we can, um, there are opportunities to reduce the context or uh, three different ways to, uh, to reduce the required context. So the first one is the new employee environment. 
Oh, actually, let me back up. So these three um, are uh, the new employee environment, designing for low context and constant context reduction. So this is kind of, um, we want context to be low when we're hired. We want to design things to be as low context as possible. And then we need to constantly be, you know, mindful that as things get more complicated and, and grow and evolve, they often require more context. We need to rein that in. So you could actually think of context as uh, similar to technical debt, right? We want to avoid it when possible, and we need a, a systematic mechanism to always be reducing it. Otherwise, it's going to grow out of control. So um, think about uh, think about that comparison as, as I uh, go through the rest of these slides. Okay, so the new employee environment. When you're a new employee, what do you need to get your job done? In most companies or organizations, you need a PC of some kind, you need the software required to do your job, and you need access and permission on various systems. And uh, I, um, I did an informal survey of my coworkers, and um, they said at the companies they've worked at, it's often one or two months before they can say, yes, they have these three things. So, and in fact, some of them worked at banks where they said six months was typical. So imagine the inefficiency of an IT department or an engineering department when people spend their first six months not able to do their job or fully do their job. Imagine how, how much lower interest rates would be if banks didn't have to take six months to bring people up to speed. Um, just, uh, just as far as the technical things of uh, what giving people the tools and access they need to do their job. So, um, and, and this kind of thing, it, uh, it stays broken at companies uh, uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, new employees, the people feeling the pain, they can't fix it. They're, they're new employees. They, they have no power, right? And experienced employees, they're not feeling the pain anymore. So they don't care. They're, so, you know, people aren't going to fix the problem if they're not feeling the pain. Um, and also, it's hard. It's hard to fix this kind of thing. I mean, just, you know, uh, making sure that on you know the first day a new employee has you know the access that they need think about that that's going to require coordinating with it infosec engineering human resources just getting all those people into the room the same room to have the discussion to to uh, even decide that this is a problem worth fixing that alone is is quite an effort and you know personally uh, you know, I when I went to university, my, my degree is in computer science, not hostage negotiation, right? So this is not something that most engineers want to take on. But who will do it if you won't, right? So we, I, I want to encourage people to think about this, uh, think about the the end to end issue of bring new employees on board and getting them up to speed, and and it's not just a charity you know thing for the the employees it makes your company more effective and and also it's not just about new employees i mean typically people change projects uh in some organizations every year or so some more some less which means you know and especially um i mean the days of joining a company and staying with one project for decades is is gone you know, we uh most businesses people are constantly changing jobs and every not jobs but projects within a company. And every time you change project, you you go back to being the new employee. And so uh, this will, you know, fixing this problem helps uh, all levels of the company. Uh, there's a new book out uh, by Gene Kim. If you're familiar with the Phoenix Project, he uh, his new book is called The, the Unicorn Project. Uh, this book is all about dealing with this problem. And he has some really brilliant things to say about it. Um, I'm not going to drill down into it anymore. This is, I, I think I've said enough. Uh, the, the book is, you know, says anything else I would probably say. Okay, so we have a new employee. Uh, we want their context to be low. And then uh, as an experienced employee, we're designing new systems and we want to design, um, design them for low context. Uh, this is like technical debt. We want to prevent we want to prevent the problem as much as possible. Uh, how can we prevent the problem? And this this goes for both designing 
you know, engineering kind of things, you know, building a, a software system, it also goes for policies. Often what we're engineering is, is a policy. And, and we want to make right easy. Um, an, another way of saying that is we want the lazy path to guide you to the right way or the, the desired way. Or as a, a coworker of mine says, he, he wants to trick his coworkers into falling into a pit of success. And um, I think if we have that attitude, uh, uh, things are going to be designed so much better. So here's an example. Um, start on the right side. Um, if you're familiar with OpenSSL, it's it's the technology behind you know uh, having your website be you know HTTPS. Um, it's it's the technology behind a lot of uh, encrypted or secure systems. And um, and if you've ever used OpenSSL, this this library is freaking difficult to use. You you practically need a PhD in cryptography to get everything just right, just for opening a basic HTTPS or you know technically TLS connection. Um, and uh, there's a fork of that project called Open or a Libra SSL, and their philosophy was much in line with what I said about we we want people to fall into a pit of success, right? So they they adopted a new API that is timelessly correct. It is, if you uh, are dumb like me and just go with the defaults, you're going to get a pretty damn reasonable SSL connection. And um, and as uh, and timelessly correct means, you know, as crypto changes, as protocols come in and out of favor, uh, going with the defaults is always just going to get you the right thing. So um, that is... That's my like favorite example of uh, building a low context system. But um, also like at Stack, we have a, a uh, and well, I guess I'd say a sophisticated CICD pipeline. And we try to embed the recommended practices into that pipeline. So if you just go with the defaults, you'll get all the good things that we're trying to get people to do, right? We, we can't like, make it a, a law or something that you have to do things a certain way, but we can make it the default. So you fall into that pit of success. And then, um, you know, mo most people are lazy. They just want to get their job done. If you make it so that all that policy stuff that you want to happen, um, happen uh, by, by default, they'll, they'll just uh, follow the defaults. Um, another great example, I was talking to some people at Squarespace, the, the web hosting company. And they had a very interesting challenge. They said, we are trying to hire tons of developers and it's hard enough to hire a developer that's really good at just coding. It's even harder to find a developer that's not just good at coding, but also understands the operational things that are needed in a modern web environment, like uh, telemetry, you know, monitoring um, telemetry, telemetry collection and standardized flags and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so what they did is they built it into the base library. So even if you're just making a little hello world program, you're going to get all that monitoring goodness and uh, all the other operational features that they want um, by default. And that was uh, that helped them scale as they hired and hired. And we, we can build this into all of your foundational tools uh, when you're designing. You know everything from uh, you know, ticket systems to bug tracking systems, to, you know, your config management, um, in all of these systems that are so critical to the day-to-day -day lives of engineers, uh, think about uh, what you're doing in the context of, or in light of how, how can I reduce the context? How can I make it easy for uh, new people to do the right thing and experienced people to fall into that pit of success? Um, okay, so we have the, the new employee situation. Now we're building things, low context. Now we have to be in this constant battle of trying to reduce uh, context because, you know, as systems grow and evolve, they get more complex and uh, context, the required context to use them successfully often grows along with that evolution. So how can we reduce uh, context. Um, there's a million solutions. Uh, I, I think um, my favorite is, is ubiquitous documentation. We need to have 
the right amount of documentation at the right time at the right place. And my symbol for this is, is yet another train station. This is Paddington Station. If you've taken, um, uh, if you've landed at uh, uh, LHR, um, ah, I'm blanking. <laughs> Um, if you flew to London and then take the train from the airport, Heathrow, London Heathrow, there we go. Um, uh, uh, if you take the train from Heathrow to London, you probably end up at Paddington Station. And um, uh, the last time I was there, uh, you know, I, I got off my train and immediately I thought, oh, now I need to find a taxi cab. What do I do? And I looked down at my feet and there was their, their ubiquitous documentation. Uh, let me turn the picture so you can see it better. Taxis to the right. This is the perfect symbol for how every documentation should be in our systems, right? It's the, it's the right amount, right? It's not too little, it's not too much. It's taxi and an arrow. You don't need the, the Wikipedia history of taxi cabs. You don't need, you know, you don't need a big explanation. You don't need any more, any less. It's just there and it's in the right place in the right time. It was at my feet, literally, um, as I was walking around. And I walked along that line, and uh, a couple minutes later, I was at the taxi stand along with probably a dozen other travelers who were following behind me as we all followed this black line. Um, so, in summary, we need documentation when you need them, and uh, you know, it's it's so much easier today because now we just. Just have a deep link URL, right? Uh, put it in your error messages. Put it in your control panels and your alerts. When you when you get paged, that page should say, you know, not just you know, system is down, but system is down, and here's a link to the uh, the page that explains how to diagnose that. Um, uh, you know, anywhere people might want information. Um, anytime you're in a high context situation and want to reduce the context, think about. Is there a URL we could provide that would um, that would help people at that time? Um, I was very impressed uh, with Apple. If if you upgraded to Mac OS uh, Catalina, they changed the default shell from Bash to ZSH. And if you so if you did a fresh install, you just got ZSH as your default shell. But if you did an upgrade and your account was your default shell was still set to Bash, um, like on my Mac. You um, you get this error me this message every time you open a terminal window. It tells you that they're they're changing the default shell. Here's the command you could run to change that shell for yourself. And if you need more information, here's here's a link. Right? They get it. They they said we're going to reduce the context by having ubiquitous documentation. And here's a link to the big document. They could have left out that last line. They could have expected you know oh, people will Google for it. They'll find it eventually. But they gave the, the link. And think about how many times we think, um, oh, you know, this error message is good enough if if they, uh, or this control panel, it, it's self-explanatory to me. Well, you know, I built the control panel. Everything in it is self-explanatory. Um, ask, take a new user, someone who hasn't seen this control panel before, and ask them, what, what questions do you have? And I bet a lot of those questions could be answered by uh, putting links to, um, uh, you know, well placed, uh, just a few well placed links. Um, and so, what this is all coming down to is we want to create a, a culture of ubiquitous documentation, and that's um, that's a big ask. That's that's harder than it it sounds, um, or it's e easier said than done, I should say. So, um, I think it needs uh, it takes a lot of different components to make that happen. Um, for example, management has to set expectations, right? Managers should have a philosophy that it's not done until it's documented. And not just for big projects, but little things too. Like if you close a ticket, um, is there some document, some wiki page, for example, that could be updated? I Last month, I challenged my team at Stack. I said, let's challenge ourselves every time we close a ticket or a bug or... Um, well, yeah, tickets and bugs. Anytime we close a ticket or bug, I let's try to update the related wiki page, even if it's a sentence, even if it's correcting a comma, even if it's uh, just saying, um, pasting in, like if you fixed the ticket 
by uh, typing a certain command, paste that command into the, the wiki. Um, the next person that has that same task can look at the web page and uh, see what command you used as a reference. And maybe, maybe a 10-minute task will become a five-minute task and will just become more and more efficient over time. Um, another thing management can do is uh, treat bugs in documents just like bugs in software. Um, I've worked at companies where people were not allowed to file bugs about documentation. Um, that's silly. Um, and I'm being polite when I say that's silly. Uh, we, you know, uh, if it's not filed as a bug, it's, you know, it's not, it's going to stay invisible and it's not going to fix. Even, even if the bug that you filed just says, this page is, is getting to be obsolete, it needs to be updated, then it can become part of the project plan to, um, you know, update those docs. Um, Oh, OK. A culture of always updating as you work. I find that one impediment to keeping documentation up to date is people wait to the end of a project and then update the documentation. I do the opposite. I actually have a, an additional monitor that I just use for updating my docs. So I am always, no matter what I'm doing, I'm always editing, or I always have the document open, and I have it open in, in edit mode uh, as I follow along. That way, if I just, you know, even if I'm just correcting a little comma, I can do that instead of if the process is, well, to make any change, you have to you know, file a bug, meet with the documentation committee, get it approved, blah, 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 blah. You don't want that. You want it to be just, uh, just part of how you do work. Um, and, uh, and also, when you're making a cultural change like this, you have to fight a lot of excuses. Like I, uh, someone told me that, they have a coworker that says, I don't have to write documentation. My code is the documentation. Well, OK, kiddo, um, that might be true. But at a minimum, you at least need to have a doc that points the person to where they'd find that source code, right? Um, uh, I think, uh, well, another inspiration, and probably the, the most selfish reason, and selfish in a good way, uh, most selfish reason that I keep documentation up to date is I can relax a lot better on vacation if I know that the documentation's up to date. In fact, ask any engineer and they will tell you that they have delayed a vacation or put off taking a vacation because they felt, oh, I can't go on vacation. They, they can't survive without me, right? Um, you know, what if something goes wrong? Well, if you are just in this habit of keeping the documentation up to date, uh, you're, um, you have less excuse to put off your vacations. Um, now, a lot of organizations don't have any documentation at all, right? So um, they need a little extra extra push. Um, and I, I think um, I think this is actually typical. I think most uh, sysadmin or DevOp or SRE organizations uh, have very little documentation. And I think that's because no one really likes to write documentation. I mean, I, I gave this presentation to a, an audience of uh, 300 people last uh, February, and I, I did a you know show of hands, and I said, "Who actually really likes to write documentation?" Like five people raised their hand. Um, I I write books and stuff. I don't like updating documentation. I I do it because uh, I I like not having. You know, I write documentation uh, because I dislike not having the documentation, not because I'd like to write. Um, and everyone has different reasons for avoiding documentation. I find that a lot of the procrastination comes down to um, uh, indecision. Like, if you don't know, the, if, if you sit down to write, these are the big three reasons that um, I have sat down to write, thought for a minute, and then gave up without writing a single word. And the, the first reason is uncertain scope. It's like, Man, what am I going to do? Am, am I writing this for? Uh, do I need to just cover the specific topic, or do I need to cover the whole background and history? And that gets intimidating, and it becomes a reason to not write. Or uncertain audience, like, do I have to write this so that uh, a new employee with no prior knowledge can can follow this document, or am I writing this for a, a very experienced person? Um, and and again, we we 
it's hard to serve two masters and we give up and we end up not writing. And, and thirdly, there's just the, where do I get started problem? And uh, writers call this the, the blank page syndrome or the blank screen syndrome, right? When you're sit staring at a blank page, it's really hard to get started. And, um, and the, the blank screen syndrome, it's all over the place. I mean, it's, you know, it's in VI, it's in Emacs, it's, uh, it's in Microsoft Word, um, you know, for you more sophisticated people with, you know, Sublime, you know, newbies with Notepad. Um, I, and by the way, as I'm a dedicated follower of fashion, so of course, you know, there's also blank mo uh, dark mode, uh, blank screen syndrome. But my, my point is that um, while not a recognized medical condition, blank screen syndrome is a very real problem. And it must be true because someone said that on the internet. I have a citation. Anyway, um, I have a couple different tricks for for solving this. Uh, one is templates. Um, the at, at Stack, there's two very common documents that we need to write called the service doc and the alert doc. Um, and the service doc is basically um, for every internal service. Um, we we try to document the same basic. Uh, information about it. And um, alert docs are basically, when you get alerted, um, we always include a, a URL to the alert doc that explains what to do for that given alert. And um, no one was writing these until um, someone came up with a template and all of a sudden it became so much easier to write these. And now we have service docs and alert docs for every situation. And uh, the these templates, um, they're actually, they're on my website, they're in my books. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, uh, so templates helps one situation. Writing small batches, uh, this is what I was talking about with, you know, always make, I'm always making little updates. Um, I find uh, environments that encourage people to write in small batches have much better documentation. Uh, the opposite of this is a co uh, a, years ago I had a coworker who who said, "Oh, I, uh, yeah, I know the documentation is terrible, but you know, I'm uh, later this year I'm going to find a full week with nothing else to do. I'm just going to dedicate that week to writing documentation, and I'm going to get it all done." And I was like, "That sounds like a terrible, terrible strategy. That sounds like a procrastination method." more than a strategy for getting writing done. Because that week where you have nothing but writing documentation, that week's never going to come. Um, it might, you know, and actually he's uh, this co-working before about, I, I try to keep up. streaming is on. Oh, hi, and welcome back. Um, so the other uh, recommendation I have is uh, for having a good culture of ubiquitous documentation is to write in small batches. So, um, the, um, for example, I mentioned earlier writing um, that I, I try to write and update docs as I'm doing projects, not at the end. Um, the, the opposite of this would be a, a fail technique. I had a coworker who uh, years ago was telling me that he doesn't do any documentation because he's waiting for a time where he'll have like a week where he can just hunker down and get all the documentation done. And that sounded more like a procrastination technique than a writing technique because that kind of week's never going to happen. I mean, as an engineer, that's really just not going to happen. I mean, maybe uh, in his mind, in, sometime in December, he was that that would happen because everyone would be on vacation. But wouldn't it be better if he could take a vacation too? Um, anyway, um, I would rather rather than wait a year and have someone write a huge amount of documentation, I'd rather have people write a, a, a sentence or a paragraph each day or each time they complete a task um, for many reasons. First of all, you get uh, you get to use that that paragraph or sentence um, is, you know, your coworkers can use it now instead of waiting for a year. And, um, and secondly, that documentation is actually going to happen as opposed to, like I said, if you know, waiting for that fictional or mythical day in the future where, where you could spend a whole week writing docs. Um, uh, another thing I find is, uh, this is more of the category of manager technique, uh, 
expectations. Um, include your documentation updates as part of your work uh, uh, estimates. Um, I've seen people say that this project should take you know, five days plus one day to update the documentation. Well, if you're phrasing it like that, that's kind of a red flag. That's saying this is a five day project and then you're gonna lop off that last day uh, or that last day of writing documentation is just never gonna come. Um, it's also kind of implying that documentation is like this extra thing that we bolt on at the end of a project. Documentation should, should not be that way. It should be just continuous. Um, another technique I find is to find where, where engineers already write and leverage that, right? So, um, you know, you, the typical engineer that hates to write, if you send them email with a question, they will reply with a five page answer, right? So, um, I think it's because they don't think of that as documentation. So when that happens to me, I reply to that email with, with the biggest compliment I can think of, which is to say, Hey, that's a great explanation. Would you do me a favor and paste that into the wiki? Let's memorialize that. So that becomes useful for everyone um, and people that are hired, you know, in the future and didn't get this email. And I do that in when I get a, a great reply by email and in chat rooms and in instant messages. And, um, uh, and I, I find that works really well. Um, and also like Stack Overflow. So, you know, I work at Stack Overflow and that's, that's another place where engineers love to write. Um, and, uh, and I think it's because it, it tears down those, those three impediments I mentioned before. There's no blank screen syndrome. You are starting with the question. And so, um, and there's wizards that walk you through it, uh, walk you through the answering, uh, steps. Um, the scope, there's no uh, question of scope because you have the, the exact question and you only have to answer that question. You don't have to answer more or less. And the audience uh, is pretty certain because you can infer the audience from the question. You can read a question and take a pretty good guess. Is this a, a beginner that I have to explain a lot of detail or is this an expert? I just can, you know, here's the command, that's it. Um, and you know, I mentioned that one of my projects at work. Oh, I oh, I yes, that's the slide for that. Um, and I I mentioned before that I work at uh, one of the projects I'm on is Stack Overflow for Teams, and um, I'm not here to give a sales pitch, but to to explain the story, you have to know what uh, the Teams product is. It's like I said before, it's a um, question and answer website for you know a private organization, and um, we had a, a really cool success story recently. There was a uh, an engineer works uh, at a big company and his job for years has been to maintain the authentication library that all their internal apps use. And, you know, it's it's a thankless job and he only, you know, hears complaints when there's bugs or he only, people only talk to him when they're complaining about bugs and stuff. But once they uh, installed Stack, uh, the private Stack, well, we call it Stack for Teams, um, not to be confused with Microsoft Teams. Um, he registered a tag for this authentication library and just started watching the, the RSS feed of um, questions that were that had that tag. And all, all of a sudden he saw um, a little community form around his little library and he felt so much better about his job because now he was like helping people. It wasn't just about bugs, it was, he was actually seeing how are people using this and what questions do they have. And, and I, I, I thought that was really great because, you know, this poor guy was like, had kind of a lonely job and now, um, now he has a little fan club and he feels good about his job because he's helping so many people. Um, so that's really my talk. Um, this third part is kind of, uh, uh, it, it's a bonus section. I, I want to talk for a minute about leadership because um, in this talk, I, I have, uh, you know, who's going to make these things happen? I talked about a lot of things today. I talked about creating a culture of documentation and smart defaults and making right easy and stuff. Who's going to make this happen? And <clears throat> I was talking to someone after giving this talk recently, and he said, um, these are all great ideas, but I don't think my manager will go for it. And I said, you don't have to wait for your manager to do things. And he said, 
he said, oh, well, you know, if I did these things, it, oh no, he, his, his concern was, he said, these are the things that managers would do and I don't want to go into management. And I said, no, 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 sir, you are confusing management and leadership. I want you to be a leader, not a manager. These are very different things. Manager is, that's like something on a business card or an org chart, right? There's, you know, it's an HR designation. You're a manager. Um, managers, you know, they, it's all about setting priorities and providing resources and clearing roadblocks. Leadership's totally different. It's not like there are no designated leaders in an organization. Everyone is a leader. Everyone can be a leader. A leader is someone, a leader is anyone that goes first and makes it easy for others to follow. So a leader is someone who goes first. So I create that template and I make it easy for others to follow, right? I put that template somewhere that everyone can access, or maybe I go into the system uh, and change the configuration so that when you start a new wiki page, it offers you one of three templates to start with. I've made it easy for others to follow. You don't have to be a manager to do that. Um, I'm building a CI CD system. I could make it super high context to get anything right, or I can provide, um, well, templates, but a different kind of template, you know, I can templatize the build system such that someone just has to specify maybe, you know, just the, the URL to the Git repo and the template figures everything else out. And maybe, maybe there's overrides for, for non-standard things, but um, uh, by, you know, that is providing leadership by creating that, by doing that system. It, it's very much like the children's game, uh, follow the leader, the, the person in the front, they go first and they make it easy to follow. Uh, so I've covered a lot of things today. Um, in summary, I hope you agree with my assertion that DevOps environments should strive to be low context. Um, there's three ways to do this. Oh, I need to update this slide. Um, smart defaults, which is the, the whole thing about new employees, um, the new employee process, we can take that very high context situation by working across silos, we can make it make make people more productive faster. Um, make right easy is about designing things with, uh, with a low context, uh, with low context in mind. So that's um, whether you're designing a, uh, engineering a, a software system or designing a policy that um, uh, if you back it up with uh, the right tools to make it easier to follow the policy than not, um, that's making right easy. And the third thing, ubiquitous documentation. We spent a lot of time talking about creating a whole culture of ubiquitous documentation. In particular, um, encouraging people to write in small batches. Um, and we also uh, further talked about why don't people document? It's um, the burden of having to decide the audience and scope, the whole scary blank screen syndrome. And how do we fix this? Templates, templates, templates. Um, repurposing text from where people already write uh, like email and Stack Overflow, and um, have some kind of central repository, whether it's a wiki or Stack Overflow for Teams or whatever you uh, find. But most of all, and if you learned anything today from this talk, I hope it's that we have to stop changing the light bulb and fix the damn sign. And uh, that's my talk. Thank you very much. Um, and now we could, uh, I guess, open the floor to questions. Okay, thank you, Tom. Oh, thanks, Tom. Sure. The uh, one di dilemma that that I face uh, as you know, somebody who works in agile environments a lot is, uh, what do you put in the story and what you put in the documentation, and the 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 heuristic that I've tried to spread the word on is, you know, anything that is only valuable for implementing the story goes in the story. And anything that you might need to know later, uh, when the story is no longer easy to find, because it's completed, uh, can go in the documentation. But sometimes you need to put it in both, like you say, just copying it. You muted. There we go. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's um, it it can be a challenge, and um, a lot of agile environments have um, exceptions for like uh, 
uh, for bugs, for example, they might permit a, a story that's less less of a you know the story template and more of a you know you misspelled this word on that page, right? Um, so, uh, uh, but you could say you know as a um, new user to the system, this documentation uh, is unclear or uh, more examples would be helpful, or as as a uh, experienced person uh, or user of this feature, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and most agile methodologies do have a, um, uh, a way of dealing with technical debt. And I think, I, I think there's, there's some good parallels there. Well, Tom? You can put your screen in uh, tile mode. Oh, sure. And that way I'll start recording tile mode again. Cool. Yep, worked. Good. Great presentation as always, Tom. Thank you. Any more questions, comments? Most people are still muted. Jabber, did you say something? I was just observing that most people are still muted. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, feel free to unmute and chime in. I think early on, a fellow Jitzer wanted to speak, but uh, he's the only one on there. We don't know who it is. By the way, this is my first time using this um, this video conference system. It's um. It's really nice. I mean, I have not, you know, usually I have some startup problem, but this just all worked. Yeah, it's we're fully open source. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you, you know, my green screen with it. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Okay, well, um, if there's no other questions, I guess we could wrap up. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, and everyone have a, a safe and happy holiday season, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I, uh, it seems like every two or three years I, I drive up to Boston and give a talk. It's, it's nice to not have that drive, but um, yep. hopefully in the future uh, I'll get to see you all in person. Oh, Good seeing you again. Can see you. Uh, Tom, could you uh, send me a copy of your slides so I can post them on the blue website? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. Sure. You have my email address already from the invitation earlier. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, cool. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Good night now.